Well, good morning. So this is uh, January 22nd. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh uh, passed away yesterday at uh, zero hours. It took me a minute because um, uh, he was the 21st here and he died on the 22nd. It took me uh, several seconds to realize, oh yes, international dateline. So this isn't a hoax. Our friends in the future. Our friends in the future. Anyway, so this is January 22nd of 2022 and this is the second issue of Toilet Talk with Dina Lynn. <laughs> and I'm wearing the same shirt as last time. Because <laughs> it's my warm shirt, yes. When I'm on the toilet, I want to be very warm and comfortable. Yes, yes. So you're seeing us at our uh, not so best, um, more or less first thing in the morning for both of us. Uh, yeah. Neither not of us have any makeup area. on. Yeah, <laughs> neither of us have I'm, any makeup on. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing myself for the first time in the camera. I'm like, oh, okay, this is how it is. So this may or may not be published as it is, but you know, I mean, I'm, you know, not, I'm not afraid. You're not afraid. I'm not okay. afraid. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, we were having a kind of having an interesting discussion, and um, I said, well, should I be recording this for Toilet Talk? And she says, well, why not? So. Uh, Dina, Lynn, you want to take so it away? So, yeah, so I brought up um, a post I shared yesterday. So let me get to it so I don't misquote myself. Because there's nothing worse <laughs> than misquoting, than misquoting myself. Okay, so what I wrote, and I, I am, um, for those who don't know, I'm a former Christian. So I'm familiar with Christianity's beliefs and tenets. And um, I kind of shed that whole thing by asking for truth at all costs and all of that. But I noticed yesterday, because one of my passions is um, having a new relationship with money, not as a thing, not as in dollar bills and coins, um, not as in the supposed gold that once or maybe still is in Fort Knox, I don't know, but it's not enough. Um, changing my relationship with money as, an, as a not just an energy, but an entity, and how that's changed my life. So I'm a, I'm sort of an evangelist for that now. So so before you go on, um, who is the uh, what's the name of the lady that wrote oh, the book? Okay. So, Love money, money loves you. Yes, I read actually two different books. Um, Robin's sister recommended Karen. Hi, Karen. Recommended that I read a book um, called um, I think it was Sacred Economics. The Soul of Money. The Soul of Money. That's yeah. it. Yes, our friend Eileen. Wrote Workman. Sacred Economics. Hi, Eileen wrote um, Sacred Economics. Don't worry, you both will be on Toilet Talk someday in the future as <laughs> we guest stars. We'll be stars. interviewing you on a toilet somewhere <laughs> close to you, yeah. Um, take the show on the road. But uh, Charles Eisenstein also wrote a book by the same title, Sacred Economics. So th this idea of money being something other than scarce, finite, hard to get, hard to keep, strive to, to earn it, um, and you're greedy if you get it, which is, you know, horrible catch 22 these concepts were already in me um and i'd read a book called getting out of debt joyfully which was a, a different approach to money so i was ripe for a book written by sarah mccrum called love money money loves you and it's it's a provocative title because the idea well yeshua his real name supposedly said the the love of money um, money is the root of all evil, even though it's the love of money is the root of many evils. And clearly, money like anything, I mean, what's the, the phrase that our, our beloved shamanic mentor Larry, hi Larry, um, <laughs> uh, said to it, anything can be either a toxin or a medicine, a medicine or a toxin, depending on dosage. So when it comes to anything, um, including sitting on the toilet too long, your legs can go to sleep, you know? Anything can be just enough or too much and therefore toxic. Anyway, <laughs> God, preamble. Um, the quote... That, you should be a politician. I should be uh, something. <laughs> I should be paid for sitting on the toilet and talking. A pun, a potty -tificator. Um My quote is, I've noticed that some folks' allegiance and defense of their belief in scarcity is akin to some Christians' allegiance and defense of their belief in hell. It kind of struck me the other day, because I tried to talk to people about, you know, you can change your, your belief and therefore your relationship and therefore your experience of money just by questioning it. And we hold these questions or these, these beliefs really closely, deeply. We consider our beliefs to be sacred, even if they're not true. 
Well, they are sacred in, 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 in a very um, very real way for each of us individually. I think yeah. that that's probably true. The, sure. the question is whether or not we allow ourselves to question them. Sure. Do they serve us? Are they helpful right. or harmful? Right. Um, did they serve us at one time <clears throat> in childhood? Well, they did, obviously. Right. Yes. And they, they helped us endure all kinds of things like trauma. But the very thing that we cling to in childhood can be the thing that bites us in the ass mm -hmm. as, as adults. Um, and I don't mean biting on the ass in that good way, you know. <laughs> we'll get into that on a different That's trailer talk. That's a different talk. topic for a different day. Yeah. So um, back to what we were conversing. It's it's a very multifaceted topic, and when you start to mess with someone's belief system, otherwise known as BS, we can call belief system BS for short. <laughs> When you start messing You've with been holding system. out on me with that acronym. <laughs> it's just so obvious. <laughs> and the word lie is hidden in the word belief as well. That's another kind of interesting thing. When we don't allow ourselves to question our beliefs and we just hold on to them because they're comfortable, familiar, even if dysfunctional, then we shortchange ourselves. And there's nothing there's nothing more frightening than questioning our beliefs because for a while they were groundless. And yet there's also nothing quite as liberating as getting on the other side of the questions about our beliefs because there's, there's, there's a world, there's a panoply of stuff to explore outside of that, that perimeter, that, that hindrance, that fence of limiting beliefs. So for me, the questioning of the beliefs is a bridge to go over that fence to the other side and just explore the territory out there. Doesn't mean I'm committing to it, doesn't mean I've permanently moved, I'm, I'm out there exploring. I can go back into the comfort of my beliefs, but eventually, if I go back and forth enough, and question enough, and go, okay, all right, I like the expansiveness out here, I can remove the fence. Often what I find is that there's, oh, yet another fence out there that I get to build the bridge across. So the, the questioning of beliefs is a way of life. It's not a, you know, a place to arrive. So, so how does this, how does this get back to um, the discussion that you or the the, the, um, the quote that you just did on right. on Facebook about um, about the beliefs around money um, specifically and how uh, how that uh, has has created a a really really limiting set of of, of fences of okay. beliefs around. <clears throat> our ability to live together in harmony on you know on the earth on in, yeah. in our in our communities individually between sure. one another sure. i mean you know what are we what are we talking about here so if we believe as we've been told and we're told all the time overtly covertly intentionally indirectly that what we need to live is limited scarce hard to get hard to keep in this case, you're talking about money or the money energy of in money, particular, but in particular, um, yes, mm -hmm. right. If if we believe that, if we buy into that, then that that's our experience. Mm -hmm. We will experience what we believe, and then we're pitted against each other because there's this thing that's limited that we both need to to survive, to thrive, to live. I'm looking at him, and I <laughs> he's, look he's at the camera. Sitting, sitting look at there. the camera. Yeah. Um, then we're we're in a state of, of competition because we, it's, it's you or me. One of us is gonna get the thing that we need in order to survive. And I like to think of that in terms of oxygen or health. Oxygen, we could say, well, we're polluting everything so oxygen is becoming scarce. I, I don't know where it's going. I. I'm not a chemist. I don't think it's leaving our atmosphere. I don't think Mars is now sucking out all of our oxygen or our water. I think we still had everything we used to have. We just need to take better care of what we've been given. That's important. We need to be good stewards of everything. Well, there is a case actually for um, the dissipation of our atmosphere into space over time, but it's exceptionally slow. So, um, <laughs> okay. You know, um, yeah. but, he's he's but... the smart guy. I'm, 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 the, I'm the potty -tificator. He's He's the philosopher. <laughs> I, I think I think part of where you're going with this, if I'm not mistaken, is that um, there's a, there's there are different kinds of competition, 
There oh, is yeah, toxic yeah. competition, and then there's ah, cooperative sorry, competition. Sorry, I'm, I'm having this OS thing, and this is my therapy. Sitting like this for a long period of time is my therapy. So thank you, people, for being with me for my therapy. So yes, there are, there are types of competition that are better than others. Well, I mean, you have a toxic competition in which is one pitted against another, and you have a cooperative competition in which is one egging others on to be better than, the, better than they were. Yes, that's like an invitation to growth. It's an invitation to growth, and we are, are, are all responsible for our own growth, but also for assisting yes. others in their growth. There can be healthy competition, <clears throat> um, like with not all sports, because some of it's kind of cutthroat, but with Olympics, where you're competing against your own best time, and you're using the best time of another to spur you on to excel. Well, even in in person on person sports, wrestling, uh, martial sure. arts, you know the the you you can't explore your full potential unless you pit yourself against another's abilities and talents, yes. which are different than yours. Yes, that so doesn't have to be done out of anger. It's a cooperative right. competition. You right. are you are using each other benevolently to improve. Well, that's You're the kind idea. of getting more of the door jam than yeah. me. I don't oh, know. sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. Is that that we're with that we're pitting ourselves benevolently, right. benevolently but against a, each other, but but mo many people don't do it, don't see it that yes, way, unfortunately. That's right. that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking right. about the belief in scarcity of that which is required for us to right. live and survive and thrive. When right. we believe there is not enough of that, um, if I take a full right. breath, full lung full of breath right now, I am not taking away your oxygen. Right. I am not preventing you from also. If I am saying I want optimal 100% benevolent health right. for myself. I want, I want my as muscle to be better. I want vertigo to go away. I want my immune system to mm -hmm. be at its best capacity, especially mm -hmm. right now. I can want all of that for me. I can have 100% fullness of my own health without depriving you mm -hmm. of that. I see money the same way. Mm -hmm. I truly have come to believe that money is nothing more than energy. And for me personally, I experience it as a benevolent entity, like I do with truth. It's it's a, I, I don't know what other word to use. It sounds very woo-woo and I can live with that. But it's, it's this force, this almost a personality that comes to me and wants to engage with me, wants to come to me and go through me out to others. It doesn't want to come to me so that I hoard, which is hoarding requires a belief in scarcity. And the only reason why we have billionaires and the poor is that both the billionaires and the poor have bought into the belief of scarcity. They're holding on to it. They're striving for it. And it's meant to flow. It's meant to be, it'd be like if some of the cells of my body hoarded all of the blood instead of letting the blood and the oxygen and the blood move throughout the body. The body has to cooperate. It can't, my cells can't compete with each other. And in fact, when we do have cells that go rogue and get independent and compete against for themselves rather than for the benevolence of the whole body, we call that cancer. So <clears throat> if you were going to go back to your, your, um, your analogy of breathing, then um, the rich would be those who uh, feel completely um, within their right to breathe as deeply as they can, um, that the atmosphere is theirs to do with what they will, mm -hmm. and nobody has the right to tell them how to go about breathing. Where the poor would be sitting there worried about how many toxins they're taking in, whether right. or not they can afford to breathe, how much... Uh, how much air is left, that there isn't enough, and they would be taking short, little, tiny little breaths, trying to conserve it as much as possible. Oh, and I just <laughs> had a flash vision of the people who've been using that very argument for why they don't want to mask during COVID. Like, <laughs> don't take away my breath. And that's, 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 uh, that's a little different of an issue, but um, just so anyone knows, um, I wear a mask when I go into the store, not when I'm walking around outside. Because I don't want to limit my actual need for breathing, but I also do want to protect others because I don't want to be one of those rogue cancerous cells that says to hell with all the rest of you, I'm going to do what I want. Because I did, there's no such thing as personal liberty without collective responsibility, personal rights without 
collective. We, we are individual and collective at once. And that's part of the whole thing here because this belief in scarcity is rooted in a deeper belief, which is that of separation. Mm -hmm. We believe we are fragmented, alone, isolated, separated from the rest of everything, including whatever you want to call the divine source presence. Um, Shahi, it doesn't care what you call it, but um, especially here in the U.S. Yes, yeah, this doesn't necessarily yes. apply as much to some other countries and, and regions right. in the world. Well, the, <clears throat> the West is known for hyper individualism, yes, without recognizing our collective connection, and in the East, they prize collective connection to the detriment often of the individual and what what we really need both yes, is to come to balance, between, yeah. you know, so that we have the, the harmony, um, what we call in shamanic circles, or at least Peruvian shamanic circles, Aini, which is living in right relationship, reciprocity, right relationship with everything. And that means everything within me, working within the cohesiveness of the, the me that is the me, and in union, within partnership, and in union community, and on the planet, and then whatever our planet is to the rest of the universe. There's, it's fractals in both directions. And boy, do we get broadly all around this topic. Um, right before we started recording, we were talking about um, the big they, the nebulous they, like, the ones that are in control of the yes. economy, the ones the that are in control experience. of the wars, the ones that are in control the of fed, society. The Illuminati, yeah. them, the billionaires, those, the the ones that control, and here we are, the poor. Anybody who isn't you or us yeah. is them. Yes. And that puts us into a state of victimhood. Like we're just a bunch of little minions, cogs in a wheel, at the mercy of the they. And they is just us. It's, it's in fact... I've come to believe that there's nothing, there's no boogeyman really, there's no enemy really, except for our own unresolved shadows that we project outward, out there. Um, we do that unconsciously so we can see it, but if we don't see it and recognize it out there, we nail it out there onto something that we call the boogeyman. I mean, right. Well, and 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 the 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 habit is for us to create these divisions. It seems. So that we feel more comfortable, comfortable about our own limitations. We, like you said, we remain in victimhood. Yeah. And and so if we can blame somebody yeah. else for all of the problems that we're up against, whether it's the scarcity of money or mm -hmm. the the uh, issues over the environment and potential, you know, human made or human contributed global warming mm -hmm. or the extinction of species yeah. or the death of individuals, then it becomes easier for us to live with ourselves as the in quotes we're good helpless. guys. We we're can't helpless. Do anything yeah. About all of that. But, Versus, so, but why? Why? Why do we want the victimhood? Why do we? Why are we sucked into powerlessness? What's the What's the secondary game? What, what are we getting off on there? Well, I mean, that's a good question. What is the secondary game? We can turn it on you occasionally. Oh well, I, I, see, well, I'm just trying to be the good, the good cameraman, and and I mean, this is supposed to be toilet Maybe talk with Dina Lynn, you. not toilet talk with Robin Wonder, which was it's... the last one where I like pretty much took the stage. It wasn't toilet talk with Dina Lynn. It was like stool talk with Robin Wonder. You know? This is wait a minute. We don't we don't want to go into stool talk and toilet talk and say that sounds really wrong. There are many stools here. I've got a stool here, a stool here, and he's sitting on a stool. And well, that wasn't exactly the kind of stool I, I was referring to. I know. I'm trying to, to clean it up. <laughs> That's where enterprises and and toilet paper, you know, converge. They both wipe out Klingons. Oh God. That's an old joke. God, that's old. I'm really disappointed that your dad didn't teach you that one. My father was a Trekkie, so so was my partner. So and and uh, no, I was I was not a Trekkie. I still am a he Trekkie. He still is. He still is. Okay, so what we're anyway, just back to what we're talking about. Um, what is the secondary game? Oh yeah, so we we okay, you, me, him, everybody out there has a shadow, and the shadow is often feared. Anything in the dark that we don't understand, that we don't see, that we don't comprehend, we 
we think of as evil. Um, we get scared in the dark. Um, the far side of the moon, who knows what's over there, right? But it's not evil, it's just we just don't see it. Well, China knows. They have a rover over there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so send your dog to the moon, and he will report back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, rover. Um, sheesh. What the heck was I talking about? I, I know Sorry. I had something. Of <laughs> Shadow, the, dark Shadow, side, we Shadow. don't know what's yes, over yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm also an evangelist for shadow work because it's, and, and it's very connected to this whole way I see money too. And and that will get into Carolyn Elliott and Existential Kink and another. In another topic. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about shadow work in another topic. When we don't take responsibility for our own shadow, which is simply the unconscious part of us, which I've been kind of stunned to realize is the biggest part of us. It's, some have said, more than 94% of us is actually our unconscious shadow. And that's what motivates us unknowingly from the dark. That's out of which we manifest our experiences. And that, I mean, that's, that's considerable. That's, we're, we're dealing with just the tip of the iceberg. That the shadow is the enormity of what we don't actually see about ourselves. And what I've been flabbergasted and delighted to learn is that I can actually engage with that part, with the shadow. I, I mean, I'm not special. Anybody can. And the shadow gets off on the stuff we don't consciously want or like. Like scarcity. There is a part of us that gets off on scarcity. And I think it's in cahoots with the ego, which really likes to strive and work hard and earn something. So prove itself. Say, I, yes, to prove I did it. I'm all that. Prove and, itself. Prove its own existence. Sure. Yeah. Um, to, to claim... It believes it doesn't have any worth or value and it has to usurp it. And when we finally realize, just in and of ourselves, we have fathomless, infinite, innate value and worth just for existing, just for being, not, not just as a human, but the part of us that just is, that's having this human experience, that and the body. It, it all has enormous value, and we're to, out, we're trying to get what we already have. To be or not to be. Yeah. And and there is no question. I mean. Well, but it's perception. Yeah. And that and that's what we struggle with is well, our own because perception. Because we live through the perception of the ego, and I don't want to mean the ego. I don't want to demonize the ego because. The only reason why I'm sitting here and you're sitting there and we're not this nebulous blob of oneness that we came from is that we, we need an ego to have this autonomous individual human experience. And we have to feel separate in order to be ourselves, in order to have a self. And we have to have a self in order to be here. And we're born, the first thing we experience when we're born is separation from the mother's body. I gave birth eight times and there's trauma going on for both the mother and the baby, especially the baby during birth, because everything we knew, our universe was the womb. Everything was taken care of. We were we were loved, and but then it got really, really, really tight. And then we, we came out. So we have these two fears, one of constriction, like don't cage me in, we want freedom. And yet with freedom comes this fear of separation. And there's this, this, this tenuous thing going on here between the two, and we carry those two fears most of our lives. We, we're afraid we're going to be alone, and yet we're afraid we're going to be smothered. And God, how many relationships? Are there? It's it's a very it's a very it's, it's a very tenuous relationship between yeah. the idea of being um, uh, inherently my own individual right. and also um, being part of uh, a larger community. So um, there's a balance there, and it and it takes a lot of uh, a lot of Harmonizing work, acceptance. Yeah, and, and and it takes it takes not like you said not demonizing either part. Right, loving every part. The I love um, internal family systems, which is all about recognizing we have um, we have a community within us. I mean, we have parts, 
and these aren't you can't measure them you can't find them you can't locate them but we we live as parts we experience parts parts of us get sort of frozen in time throughout childhood with trauma with difficult experiences um, developmental levels and I can I have an ego I have a shadow I have an inner child um, I have a critic I have right. a judge um, <clears throat> I have um, rescuers I have enablers I have you know all of these parts within me that each has sort of a life of its own and an agenda and needs that it needs met and when I listen to each part and love it and accept it and let it know it has value and it, that it's part of me and I bring them home to me then I'm, I'm living more in integrity I'm becoming more integral in my being so so it sounds like I mean to kind of bring this back to the topic at hand um, in many ways money or the idea of money or the energy of money yeah. has allowed us as individuals and society to use an externally created concept to help us um, uh, main well to help us develop and maintain and grow uh, our sense of self and independence um, it okay. is that grasp for for the item that's out there right. that Even allows us to you. maintain our independence our right. sense of self but also um, uh, holds us back from, because of the sense of scarcity of losing oneself and also the sense of scarcity of losing this resource, which allows us to define ourself, mm. um, then prevents us from really um, seeing that the sharing of yeah. that helps us. Yeah. See, to... that's, that's the point. That's where we lose the sense of community when we're thinking only about right. me, mine, I need to have, I need to have, I don't have enough, I need to get, I need to get, I need to right. achieve, I need to acquire and hoard because if I sense lose it, I lose it. Sense of losing oneself right? and the sense of scarcity. The fear of yeah. losing these artificial things that I think make me, me. Once I realize I have everything I need and I'm here to, to overflow and mm -hmm. share that exchange mm -hmm. and you but I have everything I need, and yet I'm part of this whole. So there's something not that I'm lacking or missing, but something that is enhanced right. by you. Something you bring out. It's of inspiration. Me. Yes, we inspire. We cross pollinate. So money is a an agreed upon exchange of value. It's a marker by which we show each other this. I appreciate. I mean, think about money. Money, you put it in the bank, it appreciates. Money, we show appreciation with money by saying i i love that thing you made here let me show you the value of it here here take my token of appreciation and then you let me have your thing because you're excited that i love your thing and you want me to have it i make art and i fall in love with my art and i cry a little bit when i sell it there's a piece i just finished making you can see it on facebook it's tea card it's lovely hi vicky she's the one who's buying it and when vicky gets it and i give it to her i love that she loves it makes me happy and you know but love and grief have a a shared experience as i give it to her i'm grieving the letting go of it and yet i appreciate that she has it and she gives me a showing of appreciation with money and the this money is, this is, is reciprocity it's reciprocity the money is it's a it's a it's a tangibility of joy it's it's a it's a tangible way of saying here i mean we could do it with hugs, you know? Mm -hmm. well, we, we do do it with hugs. Yes. We also, we, we give and receive. And who's giving and who's receiving in a hug, right? I mean, I could stand there like this and someone can hug me, and in which case I'm not receiving. And okay, that word, receiving. Funny how it comes up like this. I believe one of the main reasons why we do not have what we think we need from money, why money is so hard to get, scarce, etc. Or anything else for that matter. Or anything else for that matter, is our unwillingness to receive, which comes back to that feeling of, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to receive. Yeshua, we'll go back to him again. One of the things he supposedly said was... Otherwise known as Jesus, for those of you who are not <laughs> understanding the actual him. reference she's making. His mama called him Yeshua. Anyway. Um, Provided he actually existed and is not well, a composite of other figures in, in uh, biblical history. True. But <laughs> I had to throw that That's in That's <laughs> another topic for another day. But anyway, um, 
I choose to relate to Yeshua. Um, one of the things he, he is said to have said is that you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask wrongly. You ask just for yourself. And I believe, I really believe that when I am willing, it's almost magical, when I am willing to receive, when I have myself wide open in receptivity and I say yes, and it's a vulnerable, humble thing to be willing and receptive because it's not you going out and getting and making it happen. It's you being in the feminine position. And I don't mean female. We all have masculine and feminine energies. I mean, it's wide open receptivity to say, yes, I will receive. And that's, that's a vulnerable position to be in. And we tend to armor ourselves up and not want to go there. Well, it's, it's, it's vulnerable because what you're essentially doing is, is extending trust Yes. Um, saying, okay, I'm willing to receive. And there may be a desire to receive underneath, and yet that desire may not be met. So sure. the willingness to receive is is or not... Or is heard not before yes, when is, we were open before. We were yeah, willing to receive and we were injured. Yeah, it's, it's not always met with what we... with, with our expectation right. of wanting. Right. So willingness to receive, vulnerability is a state of being not an expectation to be filled or how and when to be filled, we are filled. right it's when i ha i have a relationship with the universe and so i will say, and, and money is a part of that um there's just so many parts right and it's all to me the divine it's all it all wants to relate to me and i'm part of it it's not like i'm the separate thing a, a drop of the ocean is not separate from the ocean but neither is it the entirety of the ocean in the drop, but it's nothing else but the ocean. So I see myself and everyone, everything the same way. All is God Godding is another way of putting it. So when I'm relating to the universe and I have a specific need, um, I'm, I'm ready and willing to receive all of the provision of love, of, of money, of creativity, of relationship, of healing, of everything, and I open myself wide up to that. I'm not, I'm not dictating how it shows up, or when, or what, in what form. I recognize the universe has endless ability and ultimate resources from source to send it to me. My job is to stay willingly open, and I also like to give thanks. So I will ask for a thing, or something better. Like, I want X amount of dollars or something better. Because what I really want is the fulfillment of, of my needs and my desires being met. Um, we're creators in human form. We're part of creation and we are meant to be creators. So we get to engage and ask and ask for inspiration and then take inspired action. We're meant to be not just sitting here, I made the request and now I'm just gonna sit here but it, it, it takes it. yeah it takes an openness to both give and receive yes. it takes the willingness yes. to both give and receive the reciprocity and and I think that's that's the thing is that it's not again it's not just about open yourself up to um, to having your expectations fulfilled but rather being open to the idea that that, that what we're doing is is working within the flow of life yeah, the flow we get to of participate energy. in dance yeah. and yeah. and and when, when one person wins, everybody wins. Yes. And when everybody wins, yes. one person wins. But that's not about winning as in, oh, I won everything and you got nothing. No, no that's not about it. It's, it's, it's got to be win-win. Yes, exactly. And the more, I, the more I come into my own empowerment and autonomy and individuation and seeing myself as valuable, the more that happens to me, at the same time I recognize, oh, wait, I'm part of all that. I'm part of everyone. Everyone and everything is interconnected. And it just intrinsically, inexplicably, we, we can't disconnect. And so it's never about me, just me for me. It's always whatever good I get, I can't wait to tell people. I can't wait to share, not, oh, let me give you out of what I have, which is which I can do, yes, of course I can. But I wanna teach other people or inspire other people to, you got me out of I'm, I'm, I'm like sorry. leaning sorry, over. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna fall off the toilet trying to stay in the frame. Terrible cameraman. Terrible cameraman. Well, I have no screen on this side, so this, look at you through. So, 
um, the more uh, I want to inspire other people to recognize their own true self, their own true nature, their own empowerment. You know, the I don't want to teach people. I, I don't want to give people fish. I want to teach them. To this fish. The, this is the ba this is the the basic concept behind uh, UBI, Universal Basic Income, yeah. is the idea that trickle down economics really doesn't actually work. Yep. That yeah, for an economy uh, and a society to be healthy. All people need to be able to have what they have their yes. needs met, have their have some wants and desires at their fingertips, yep. um, able to pursue those, and through that, then they contribute more to the entire community by having something we to have, give. We have excess. When, we, yes, when we our have our what to met, give. Uh, Maslow's bottom, the bottom, bottom rung of the hierarchy, the the basic needs for survival. When those are met. Um, food, water, shelter, clothing. Then we have the ability to give of and, ourselves. And sex is down there too, people. You need to know that's a basic need. When those things are met, <laughs> it's true. I've seen it. When those things are met, then the next level um, becomes wants. And then we get to the place of creativity. That thing in us that we can't not do. That passion that we oh, I wish I had time to do that. Whatever that is for each of us. Right. But it's, then it, it overflows yes. onto everybody else. But it's going to take time to develop that kind of a structure. Because we're all still in this... Well, uh, yeah, in in this um, 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 rat race, um, I, I'm not waiting treadmill for society and right. culture to finally figure it out and get better. No. I'm not going to be a victim of a messed up society. I'm going to do what I can now for me because it's not just for me. Right. If each of us does our own internal work, our shadow work, our healing from past traumas, our self actualization work, and we get healthier and more integratedly whole within ourselves as we each take that on as a personal mission and responsibility. We can't help but become contagious catalysts for everybody else around us. That's how it works. And plus, I don't know about anybody else, but when I get something good going for me, I can't shut up about it. I have to tell other people. It kind of gets annoying at that knock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an uber foister. I have to tell people. Yeah. It's like if we were all starving and I found some bread. It's like, I'm going to show you where I found the bread. I'll bring you some bread, but how much better if I show you where to get it. And then you can show others. So we all take a walk, go go down and get your own, get your own, get your bread. Yeah, it's good to take a walk. And 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 maybe you have some jelly that you can bring with you to give to the people and, that have and bread. Somebody's got some peanut butter somewhere. Mm. And and probably somebody has some chocolate. But Lord forbid we get your <laughs> chocolate and my peanut butter. Ooh, that would be a fascinating product. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we should probably wrap this up. We're running on almost forty minutes. So. Yeah, that's 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 about as much time as anyone wants to spend looking at me on the toilet well and your side butt and my side butt so anyway um you know thoughts to consider um do uh, is there any other real quick thoughts you want to share before we wrap um, this up nothing's coming to mind right now um it just i guess what do you have to lose by questioning your beliefs regarding money is it true? Could something be as true or truer? Uh, what would it be like for you? What would your life be like if you didn't believe and therefore experience money as being scarce and hard to get? What might be fun just to play around with that, experiment a little bit, see how you see how you feel about it. And and again, this is not um, this is not. Uh... We're not saying that money as it is in the current system uh, is is um, is flowing well. We're not saying that. What we're saying is that um, money as an idea is um, is an is an energy. It's it's also a state of mind, um, and our states of mind are what keep us limited uh, in how we have the ability to grow. And and the more often, the more that we can question our beliefs and then work with others to question those same beliefs, the more likely we are to create a system which, uh, a system and a, an interconnection which really does flow freely yeah. between people as opposed to um, being limited by uh, our beliefs that we need to, uh, that we need to hoard, that we need to 
um, look out only for ourselves. Or live in fear. I, yeah, I, live in fear of looking out for ourselves. I really believe um, all of our problems stem to the, the stubbornly persistent beliefs in separation and in scarcity and in the resulting um, cutthroat competition. And protecting ourselves at all costs. Right, because of those things. Uh, imagine the boy well, living in a bubble. Yeah, and, and instead we need to shift into the awareness of the truth of unity, of abundance, and of collaborative cooperation. Right. And it, I think we're in the shift of that in humanity. Um, and uh, I think it's we're, we're seeing the the dying, grasping, gasping of the age that's dying. That's all about separation, scarcity, and competition. Right. And um, that's why it's tough right now. It's not that those things are are true. It's just that it's going like this as it's. As we it's are starting dying. to realize that we are all unique components. Yep. Um, truly. Diversity within uh, unity. Truly sacred. Yep. Um, unique components. Worthy, with, valuable. Yep. Mm -hmm. But. Like you said, um, within a larger, um, within a larger system yeah. that is reliant upon us to uh, to come together yeah. to create magic. And the more we accept and love ourselves, the more we love and accept others because we see them just right. like us. Right. If we're not loving and accepting ourselves, then the likelihood is we don't see the value and unique uh yeah unique specialness in we each do other. love neighbor as badly as we love ourselves <clears throat> yes we or, do or or as well as we right. do right yeah so this has been the second episode of curly talk <laughs> brought to you by dina lynn robin wengert side butt oh <laughs> And and uh, our our favorite time of chatting. Well, not necessarily our favorite time of chatting, one but this is certainly one of our favorite ways to sit down and have um, intense discussions where shit gets real. Shit gets real. Yeah. All okay. Right. Bye, everybody. See you later. <laughs>